This is an update, October 30th, 2008. I had a client come in and say to me, uh, you know, Drew, I uh, get your emails and it's fine to see the words on a page, but I really need to see you and hear you. And if you would do your updates on video, it would be appreciated. And I'm sure there are a lot of you out there that are like that. So we're going to videotape them when we can. Nothing professional. We're just going to you know, just kind of wing it, get it, get it done, put it out there for you, the, you who want to watch it on video. Otherwise, it'll be in written form if you want to just, uh, if you want to just read it. So, basically what we have going on right now is a rally's taking place. And the rally's one of three things. First, there's a bull bounce, a bull move, and a secular bull market. There's three different things, and it could be any one of the three. Here's a bull bounce. A bull bounce, the market goes up for a month or two, maybe six at the most, and boom, it collapses again and goes down even harder and farther than where it just was. Second is a bull move. A bull move is something like, take the end of 2002. The market went down, down, down for three years, and then all of a sudden it turned in 2003 and went up in three, four, five, six, and part of seven, and then all of a sudden it collapses back down to its previous low in 2002. So that was a bull move. And the last one's a new secular bull market. The best description of that would be 1982. In 1966, the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit 1,000, and then in 1982, it finally broke out of that 1,000 trading range and moved on to a new high, and never ever went back to 1,000 again. 20 years later, we're at 14,000. That's a bull market, a secular bull market. Unfortunately, right now, I think we're in the most likely scenario, this is a bull bounce, which is not something we want to be around at the end of. So that's point number one. So what are we doing about it? What are we thinking about? It? Well, first, we're not making any new investments. Um, everything we've even considered uh, just continues to get slaughtered in these markets. So we're not making any new investments until we absolutely feel that the risk opportunity is, is good. Um, and we're sitting pat on the things we currently have. Second, we're harvesting tax losses. So you're seeing us buy something uh, very similar and selling something we currently own. This locks in the tax loss so that we can use the tax losses on into the future um, anytime we want to against gains or against other income. So it kind of gives us a present value um, opportunity of taking advantage of these tax losses. Third, we are watching Asia uh, develop into what I consider to be probably the most tremendous um, opportunity that we'll see in our lifetime. and. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. Um, number four, we believe that the dollar is being devalued to help deal with the credit crises. Um, you see, inflation is the best thing that can happen to a debtor. So if you owe money, if you owe money to somebody and uh, um, you get to pay it back with inflated dollars, it's uh, the best thing that you could ever hope for. Um, and so there are a lot of Americans with a lot of uh, debt outstanding that if they could pay it back with inflated dollars would be quite satisfied. And I think that uh, Chairman Bernanke thinks that this would be a reasonably good thing right now is to somewhat devalue the dollar. At least that's our take on it. We also think that there could be a dollar crisis that would be the ultimate culmination of this uh, of this secular bear market, and it could last, it could happen, you know, in a year. It could happen in five years. It could even be ten years until this manifests. And so, what we're doing is we're keeping some money invested to take advantage of a dollar devaluation as long, um, in case it should catch us by surprise. And lastly, um, if the dollar is being devalued, which we think it is, commodities should start to percolate and do better again. And I would not be surprised with five to six dollar gasoline, two thousand dollars an ounce of gold, two hundred dollars a barrel of oil, 
those things would not be out of the question if the dollar is being devalued. So our portfolios reflect this concept. Right now we have well over a third of our money with most clients. Not every client is going to have this exactly, but our typical client is going to have a third of their money completely safe in treasury bills, federally insured CDs, um, uh, with at least a third or more of your money. 20% is in a relatively safe global bond position, countries around the world, um, you know, short-term bonds, uh, to take advantage of any U.S. dollar currency devaluation. 20% are in high dividend paying blue chip stocks and value stocks of Asia, 25% in dividend paying blue chip stocks and value stocks of the U.S. and Europe. Um, and the remaining 5% of the portfolio is in commodity stocks uh, or commodities themselves held inside of some of our mutual funds. Like some of our funds hold a, a lot of gold. Uh, we have one fund, Sojin Global, holds, I believe, 8% of their portfolio in actual gold bullion in a uh, safe in New York. So um, that's about 5% of the total portfolio right now. So some have asked me, why do you have such a strong stance on Asia? I don't, I don't understand. Let me give you six points. Point number one, their governments are not overtly leveraged and they hold enormous cash reserves. China has $2 trillion of real money. The USA has maybe two, um, maybe $400 billion. Uh, last I looked at the Fed balance sheet. That's real solid treasury bills or whatever of the euro, of the yen, of the United States, or something of that sort. Um, the average Chinese saves 15 to 25 percent of their earnings. That's all throughout Asia. And when I say Asia, again, I've told this to many people, I'm referring to Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and China. So I'm not, I'm not specifically referring to India, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, you know, places of that sort. I'm sticking with those main Japanese, Chinese, and related type countries. <clears throat> they save 15 to 25 percent of their earnings. The average American saves zero percent. The average Asian does not use debt to buy cars and luxury goods. They pay things in cash. The average Chinese, uh, uh, Asian I should say, graduates high school with a better education at the end of four years of high school than the average American after four years of undergraduate study. China represents 4% of the world GDP. The United States represents 26% of the world GDP. Yet China holds one-fifth of the world population. The United States less than 10% of the world uh, population. Actually, if I think about it, it's, uh, it's less than 5%. It's just about 5% of the world population, yet they hold 20% of the world population. Um, and, and yet they're a very small part of the world GDP, and yet there's an emerging middle class that's larger than the entire U.S. population in their, in their country. And so people say that when the USA gets sick, the rest of the world catches pneumonia because the USA is such a huge part of the GDP. The, the issue here, though, is, is that sooner or later, Asia's own internal consumption is worth every bit of the stock market's prices in those countries. So, in other words, if the, the Chinese market is down 68% this year, when does it get to a point where their market is just worth what they sell to each other, let alone what they sell to Europe and the United States? 